today I'm, I have the pleasure to be joined by former NASA astronaut and West Point graduate Mike Mullane, who flew aboard the um, three space shuttle missions as a mission specialist on STS-27R, STS-36 and on mission 41D. So it's a pleasure to be joined by you, Mike, today. And it's a pleasure to meet you, Matt. Well, my uh, my dad, as you mentioned, he was a World War II aviator uh, flying aboard B-17 bombers, although it was in the Pacific theater uh, of the war. And uh, I, after the war was over, he stayed in the Air Force flying in transport aircraft. And my myself and my brothers were always around airplanes. He would take us out to the flight line, let us get onto some of these transport airplanes while they're in maintenance. And uh, so that exposure uh, it certainly produced a fierce interest in aviation and flying in my own heart and soul. And so that, as I grew older, I wanted to be a pilot. I wanted to fly and I aimed my life toward, uh, toward that. But then in 1957, when Sputnik was launched, uh, I was a child of the space race. I became fully invested in everything associated with space. Uh, and I wanted to be John Glenn and Alan Shepard. Of course, I was a kid watching this. I was only 12 years old. Uh, and um, well, I was 12 years old with Sputnik. I was a little older later on when the astronauts actually started flying. But uh, at any rate, that's uh, where I started. Intimidation is probably comes to mind to be sitting around in a room with people who walked on the moon. There were still a handful of moonwalkers uh, in the astronaut office when we got there in 1978. They quickly retired though, and uh, one remained, John John Young, uh, a two-time Apollo astronaut, and also walked on the moon. Actually, he flew twice on Gemini, twice on Apollo, and twice on the space shuttle. So at any rate, uh, he, he, and being around all of these other super achieving people that have been s selected in my class really was, uh, you had a sense of intimidation and a sense that you better better make sure you perform at the level that's, uh, you know, that's gonna be expected of you. Uh, but um, rapidly we all came together uh, in that group, um, had a lot of fun uh, along the way, uh, but worked hard to make sure we were prepared for the missions that we we're gonna fly. Yeah, we'd wake up about five hours before launch. Uh, they would schedule a brief breakfast, but first of all, it's hard to get any sleep the night before a shuttle launch, and you really don't have much of an appetite at breakfast. Uh, obviously, you had some butterflies floating around in there on a first mission like this, uh, knowing there's a lot of new things that are going to happen. And it's a lot of fear factor, too. Yeah. Uh, you know you're going to be putting your life on the line on the top of that rocket. So that's all at play. Uh, around three hours before liftoff, we drive to the launch pad, uh, strap in, uh, and probably have about an hour and a half to two hours laying on our backs out there, strapped into the cockpit, awaiting launch. And as I said, <laughs> you do fear for your life while you're out there. But at the same time that fear was on me, I was boundlessly joyful because yeah. it was a lifetime dream come true to make this flight into space. So. Even though I had that fear on me, I was simultaneously, it's bizarre to be afraid, but at the same time to be boundlessly joyful, but that's what I was experiencing. Okay, yeah, when the, uh, we have a go for auto sequence start. We can get the engine start, you get this heavy vibration in the cockpit. I'll watch for that. Yeah. Primary control with critical vehicle functions. Minus 20 seconds and counting. Oh, well, we're up to 20 seconds. Yeah, right in here. We don't really have anything to do here. We're along for the ride unless something goes wrong. Uh, the launch is all on the autopilot. So, uh, as I said, it's hands off during launch unless you have a problem. We have main engine start. Get the three, three liquid engines start. One. At peak zero, the hold down bolts flow. The solid rocket is ignited and you're slapped into your seat with a pressure of about two Gs, two times gravity as the rocket leaps off the launch pad. Well, you get this heavy vibration, and as soon as the boost, as soon as you reach what they call T0, time zero, the solid rocket boosters ignite. Uh, and the purpose, by the way, of 
igniting these three liquid engines six seconds early is they can be checked by computer and shut off if there's a problem. Whereas when the solid boosters ignited, there was no going back. So you wanted those liquid engines checked by computer before the commands were issued to fire those solid rocket boosters. When those, uh, when those fire, you get this heavy vibration. Well, actually when the three liquid engines start six seconds before liftoff, you get this heavy vibration in the cockpit. And then at uh, T0, boosters ignite, you're slapped into your seat with a force of about two Gs, two times gravity. You know, and the rocket just leaps off the launch pad. Uh, there's a lot of noise and vibration during the ascent until the solid rocket boosters uh, separate. When they burn out and separate, you're up about 25 miles in altitude, which is well above most of the atmosphere. And so we don't, at that point, when those boosters are gone, you don't have these shock waves, you don't have the noise of the boosters. So from that point on, six and a half more minutes into space on the three liquid fueled engines, it's very smooth, very quiet. The only way you can tell you're moving besides look at your instruments are the G-forces slowly rising in your body. And ultimately those Gs will reach three Gs, three times the force of gravity. Yes, on that, uh, my second mission, well, the mission we're talking about here, second after Challenger, uh, during ascent, the tip of the right side solid rocket booster mm. broke off uh, due to some manufacturing defect and hit the uh, heat shield on the shuttle up underneath the nose area and up underneath the, the, the right wing. And uh, we didn't see that during launch, but the ground knew, knew that it happened and directed us to use the robot arm, which had a camera on the end of it. And I was the robot arm operator. Uh, they sent me instructions to bend this thing at a crazy angle to be able to survey the area that they thought had been hit by this debris. And we could see that we had taken a severe hit. Uh, there were hundreds of tiles that had been damaged to some degree and there was one uh, tile in a very high temperature part of reentry up under, up near kind of the, the belly of the spacecraft up toward the wing where the wing joins the spacecraft up, up in the nose area. And uh, that one heat tile had been completely blasted off, uh, which exposed the underlying aluminum of the, uh, of the vehicle to the 3000 degree heat of entry. Now the engineers were confident that the tiles that remained in place around that hole would protect uh, any of that severe heat from reaching that aluminum that was down there. And, and they were right. As it turned out, we landed okay. Reentry is the same on every, was the same on every mission. And I can describe that is that uh, here you are going around the earth at 17,500 miles an hour to get out of orbit, you have to slow down. So we have those small engines we use to fire to push us into our final orbit. We now turn the orbiter backwards in orbit. So the engines are now facing the direction you're moving. And we fire those uh, same engines for a couple of minutes to slow us down a little bit. And what that does is it changes our orbit so that the orbit now enters the atmosphere. That's our break. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to slow down to be able to land obviously. And so we use the atmosphere as our break. The shuttle turns back forward after firing those braking rockets and tilts the nose up 40 degrees. That's where that heat shield is on the belly of the orbiter. So that's presented to the atmosphere and we start falling uh, slowly down into the atmosphere. And as you hit the atmosphere up around 70, 75 miles, somewhere in that area, uh, it's thick enough to start forming that, that tremendous heat uh, that, that, that uh, due to friction and you're, protected hopefully by your by your heat shield and the shuttle we come out of orbit over the indian ocean that's a half a world away from florida if you drilled a yeah. you know through the earth center of the earth from florida you're going to come out over the indian ocean so that's where we start our re-entry uh, we fall across the indian ocean across australia across the pacific ocean across central america across the gulf of mexico all slowing down dropping in altitude until we're able to land in Florida.